And we are back on the fastest show on iSports Radio. My name is Daryl Kinsey Jr. Welcoming you to the lap of the extra mile for today, June the 9th, 2022. And it is that time again for the greatest endurance race in the world. The Le Mans 24, also my favorite race, had some big announcements during Le Mans 24 weekend we'll get into. Also, NASCAR is heading out to wine country. And why does everybody hate Ross Chastain? We're going to get into that as well. And also, Formula One is going into Chaosville, also known as Azerbaijan, for the Grand Prix of Azerbaijan and Baku, where every single race has had something crazy go down at some point and help me talk about it. Of course, my co-host Christopher Lehman. Christopher, welcome. How are you doing this evening, Daryl? I'm doing good. Uh, traffic getting home was not fun for me. Uh, as you know from the previous hit I did on a podcast for my actual job, uh, there's one main road connecting Charles County and Prince George's County. Uh, that's Route 301, and somebody up near my neck of the woods hit a power line and draped it across the road. So it took me two hours at one point to get from the weight scales on 301 um, in Prince George's County to my house. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the geography of where all that is. Usually, I can cover that stretch of road in 10 minutes. It took me two hours. Yeah, Daryl, that seems like a lot. It is very a lot. It is so, very a lot on 489 gas. It it feels I I feel like I can empathize with your situation, Daryl, because I watched uh, the Road America race, and mm-hmm. you essentially drove one caution caution cycle on your way home today. <laughs> yeah, I basically drove one Road America caution lap to get home. So. <laughs> Which, by the way, that race is coming up in a month. Hopefully, they'll work that caution thing out. Maybe we'll see. But we're going to go ahead and get into the program. We're going to start with NASCAR this week because that was the most interesting race of the weekend um, out there. The Visit Illinois 300, which was actually held not too far from East St. Louis um, on the Illinois side of the border. Uh, fun fact, uh, my girlfriend told me that because her mother is from St. Louis. But the main thing to take away from that race, other than yet another 2311 disaster for the 23 but i got all that out uh last night on dropping the hammer with daniel mcfadden thank you so much for him to have me on by the way uh the other part of that chris everybody wanted to fight ross chastain at the end of that race yeah that's you know i didn't i didn't watch the race i watched part of it but not not very much of it um and I, I personally didn't see anything with Ross Chastain real time, but I, I saw the previews and, and realistically from the previews, what I saw, I mean, I, I don't understand where the outrage comes from. If I'm being completely, totally honest, um, it just seems like people are maybe a little extra about it for some reason. And um, I, I don't know why it, I don't think Ross was was out there trying to ruin anybody's day. I think he just was getting every little bit out of his car he could, and you know everybody's done it. I, I don't understand why Denny Hamlin in particular was the guy with the camera, besides you know his little tactics holding Ross up. But I don't, I don't know. It just it just seemed like the media hyped it up way more than is even responsible if that makes sense to you well the thing with hamlin and chastain is this is not the first time this season those two have got into it chastain uh knocked hamlin around a couple of times this year and hamlin was tired of it the chase elliott one is the one where i'm like okay that we're kind of blowing it out of proportion it was on a restart chastain took it three wide on a track that was 
until the second half of the race really hard to pass on. Uh, was it an optimistic move? Probably. But this guy, uh, he doesn't hold back when he races, and that kind of ruffles some feathers, and he doesn't care. But I thought, personally, Denny Hamlin deciding, okay, I'm going to make this guy's day a living hell for the rest of the race was hilarious. And we need more of drivers being pissed off at each other like this because this sport is a lot more fun when there are long-standing rivalries like this. I mean, the Kurt, uh, not Kurt, sorry, the Kyle Busch, Brad Keselowski rivalry is kind of petered out. Um, Harvick and Elliott has also cooled mainly because Harvick is just having a terrible season. Um, kind of like Logano last year. Kyle, mm-hmm. Yeah, last two years. Good point. Um, Kyle Busch and Joey Logano, it's still hot, but it's not as hot as it's been. Ross Chastain versus the field. Just inject that into my veins at this point. When, when there's rivalries like this, the sport is fun. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. And, and um, <clears throat> you know, Ross is kind of the the new guard that we talk about with, with, you know, every, I mean, not even unique to racing, but every sport. You've got the young guys coming up and, and the old guys trying to hold on and, and finish out their career strong and, and cement their legacy. However, you know, that, that may be. And, um, you know, but Ross is, Ross is definitely showing that he is going to be, I think he's going to be a future champion. Um, I just, I think he's, he's got it. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I, it's a, it's a, bold comparison to make but I think that if I was going to make a comparison I think Ross Chastain is the slightly less talented Max Verstappen definitely that young guy who has all the potential in the world is going to race you aggressively to win and rub people the wrong way because of it Um, I don't know that's just kind of a comparison that I had never put much thought into until like the last 30 seconds, as you can probably tell. Yeah, I I could tell, but (laughs) I think the funniest part about that whole rivalry is that it spills to Twitter. Uh, Denny Hamlin made a comment about it and yeah, Denny Hamlin made a comment about how uh, Chastain needed to be put into the fence and Justin Mark was like, bring it on. Like, Justin Marks wants all the smoke, and I'm already a fan of Trackhouse Racing. That's making me a bigger fan of Trackhouse Racing because he's stuck up for his driver. But I can't think of a rivalry where, A, one of the people in it is an owner-driver, and B, the other owner, who used to be a driver, basically said, bring it on, we ain't scourged. Yeah, this is definitely a unique rivalry, um, and um, <clears throat> it's it's just funny. Is if I think back and and just kind of open the history book a little bit, Denny Hamlin is involved in a lot of beefs, almost disproportionately more so than the rest of the field. I mean, think about it. He had the deal with Chase. Um. Uh, he Bowman last year, um, Chastain this year. I'm, I know that there's another one that I'm forgetting. I just can't think of who it is. Um, but he just has these like irrational beefs for some reason. And the common denominator is him mm-hmm. and Chevrolet, I guess. <laughs> but I don't know. Denny just, he's, Maybe the distraction's pulling away from his ability to to win a championship. He's definitely gotten a bit snippier lately, especially since he started running this team. And then, of course, the issues they're having with the 23 over there, which they had another bad finish while Kurt Busch finished in the top five. They somehow got that car figured out, but they can never get the 23 figured out. Let me stop. 
before we go on another rant. Y'all know how I feel about that team right now. But speaking of that 23, they got punted out the way by Ricky Stenhouse Jr. for some reason. And speaking of random rivalries, uh, BJ McLeod got mad at Chase Elliott for something like on the same lap of the incident with him and Ross Chastain. I don't know if it was the lack of passing in the beginning of the race or the fact that we don't ha- have that many off weekends. We've been nonstop since February. The Cup Series grid is getting really testy with each other. Yeah, I, I wasn't aware of of the that one but yeah i would i would agree that racing is starting to get a little aggressive and it's definitely time to start pulling some drivers aside and and uh or or they just need to get some get a break in here which i think we've got one coming up in a couple weeks? I think July is when we get the only off week of the season here. Oh, jeez. Yeah, they've got to add some more. Off- We're supposed to get the 2023 schedule in August. They have got to add some off weeks to this schedule. They. This is ridiculous. It just ties in with the length of the season. They need to shorten it. It's, yeah. You know, I could see even taking five, ten races. 10 being extreme, but take five races off and, and get these guys, you know, one weekend a month off. And mm-hmm. I know it makes for good TV, but I mean, the fans get burnt out on it too. I mean, if, if we're having this type of action every week, eventually it loses its, its luster. Well, the good thing is after they get done with Sonoma, they go on a off weekend before they go to Nashville But after that, it is from June 26th. They don't stop again until the end of the season on November 6th in Phoenix. Yeah, that is. They've got to get some breaks in there. I I think that's non-negotiable. Yeah. No, I, I completely, completely agree with you. But in good or it was another good finish that we've had on a mile and a half this year. And just overall, because we've had a lot of great finishes at the end of the season with the next gen car with Kyle Bush and Joey Logano, just going at it the last 30 laps, including the first over the only overtime after Kevin Harvick lost his brakes with four laps to go. Logano and Kyle Busch, we know these two don't like each other. We know Logano's going to be aggressive because he doesn't make friends out there. It was a great battle. I wish Harvick's brakes hadn't gone out because I really wanted to see if we were going to get a Darlington 2004 Redux with that car, I mean, with that finish, if um, they didn't get that caution because Logano there, he was getting to... Kyle Busch's side are getting to the side of the number 18 into the corners. We just couldn't carry the momentum out. I really wonder if you would have tried to throw it in there and muscle um, Kyle Busch out of the way, which you probably would have, and how that would have looked on pit road. Probably another brawl between 22 and 18, but we still got another great battle between two eternal rivals. Give Chris a minute. I think he's having a little bit of technical issues. Don't hear you. Can you hear me now? There we go. Yeah, now we got it. Okay. I don't know. The wire, like, I don't know, like the wire in this little box thing, like, kind of Mm -hmm. popped out a little bit. I'm not sure. Yeah, I'll probably have to order a new new headset just just to be on the safe side. I don't know. I don't even know what happened there, but I immediately knew something was wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you did in fact cut out for quite a bit of what you said. Um, mm-hmm. so I was a little disconnected, so I don't know how to respond. 
basically the question basically what i said was i really wish that harvick's brakes didn't have that issue because i really wanted to see how the battle between kyle bush and joey logano was gonna shake out because kyle had the better exit through the corners but logano had a good entry or had better entry and it really set up a situation where logano could have sent it in there and kyle with uh, two laps to go or coming to the last lap. Oh, were they, I didn't see very much the race, but they, so I, I can't really give an honest answer on that, Mm -hmm. but, um, it it would have been interesting to see if, if they, if they, uh, were able to stay together. It was really door to door and it was a lot of fun, but, um, Logano once again taking a win on a new track and once again taking the battle and winning the wars against people that uh apparently said they didn't like him. So uh just gonna put that out there for all the folks that talk about well we're not gonna we're gonna make sure Logano doesn't win the war. He keeps winning these wars, y'all. Just saying. Yeah, he is routinely the winner in these. Um which is kind of funny. But we'll see. They're heading out to Sonoma this week, and we're going to be going back to the short shoot with NASCAR going back out there for the road course race. That race was delayed in 2020, or did not run 2020 due to the pandemic. And then 2021, Kyle Larson ended up taking the win out there, but Larson has struggled this year. Uh, He has definitely not been on the winning pace He was last year. That was going to be hard to replicate anyway, but it has definitely been a championship hangover for our defending title winner as we get into the summer months. Yeah, Larson's definitely, I mean, the term sophomore sump doesn't really apply because obviously he has been in the Cup Series for quite a bit longer than that, but but his Hendrick, you know, second sophomore season has been, uh, disappointing if if we're being realistic um definitely after his sensational season last year um in, in all fairness probably just about any success he had this year wouldn't measure up to last year just because of how he he took the the world by storm myself included i didn't i didn't see him I didn't have him winning a race at all last year. I don't think you did either, Daryl. I didn't have him um, winning the. I didn't have him making the playoffs, and I ate the biggest humble pie on that. Yeah, yeah, I think we all did, and uh, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. I like that. Yeah, um, yeah, it's. I wasn't afraid to admit it either. So, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. All four Hendrick cars are obviously in the playoffs, so uh, I guess we'll. Let them battle it out. Yep. And on the other side of things, going into this race, it is a road course, so we also have to watch out for A.J. Allmendinger, who picked up a win in convincing fashion in Portland after running off the track and going a lap down at some point, came back to win. Anytime we were at a road course with A.J. Allmendinger in one of these cars, he is a threat to win, and he could shock the NASCAR world or the NASCAR Cup Series regulars once again, like he did uh, earlier, or no, like late last year in Indianapolis. Although in that race, he got a little help when Chase Briscoe went a little bit crazy. Yeah. Nope, I remember that now. Um, it's it's definitely interesting. And, and actually, it's there's quite a few guys right now who I think if you look at the field as a whole are definitely – um, I, uh, the days of the road course ace, the ringer, um, those are kind of gone, especially with us having seven or six or however many we're doing this year. Um, but I mean, I look at the field and yeah, uh, the dinger, you got Chase Elliott, you got Kyle Larson, you got Chase Briscoe. Um, I think even Austin Sindrick could be considered a, a bit of a road course guy. Um, if I'm not mistaken, 
I think he, he I think he got a couple in, in Xfinity or at least finished well in in Xfinity. And then you also got Christopher Bell who straight up beat Chase Elliott in in uh twenty twenty, I think at the day at Daytona. Um until Chase Elliott kinda lost the mental battle, but but Christopher Bell was right there with him, so it, it's going to be interesting, and I th- I think road courses have become more fun now that y- you don't just look for you know the the ringers like AJ Dinger to come in and just you know decimate the field by you know five ten seconds or whatever. I mean, there's there's a good five six guys who are who are right there and and would be unsurprising to pull out a win, and you wouldn't say that they backed into it. You'd say that they genuinely earned it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the 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 time of the road course ringers when we'd have Ron Fellows come back for a couple of races and go out there and run well and Boris said and the said heads being out there at the track. I think those days are over. These guys, all of them now are pretty good at road courses and you're just not going to throw one of these ringers out there and expect to win other than AJ Allmendinger who's really not a ringer anymore. He is a NASCAR regular at this point, and he is really, really good at what he does. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to get into Le Mans 24. It is the most wonderful weekend of the year, racing all day on Saturday. The qualification qualification session for the pole positions in all four classes was today, a couple hours ago. I'll let you know who was on the pole. We'll be right back after this here on the Extra Mile on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. What's up, everybody? This is Taryn Rodriguez. Are you a fan of volleyball? Are you a fan of Thunder Spikes? Then I have the show for you. Set Point, where I cover NCAA men's and women's volleyball, high school boys and girls volleyball, beach volleyball, and even professional volleyball. Catch the action every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. The world of semi-pro sports is unlike any other sports organizations. Players pay to play in hopes of so many different outcomes, whether it's playing to get filmed to try out for professional teams, big-time colleges, or just playing to stay in shape. No matter what, all semi-pro players have one thing in common, and that's playing for the love of the game. The SoCal Warriors have been on a quest to earn titles and give players second chances since 2017. Whether you're in Southern California or anywhere in the world, Give Semi-Pro Sports a chance if you love your sport. You may get that second chance you've been waiting for as an athlete. Follow them on social media and Twitter at SoCal Warriors, Instagram Southern California underscore Warriors, and Facebook Southern California Warriors. Attention all sports fans! If you're someone who wakes up each morning with list of sporting events to go along with your to-do list for the day, then you just might be a diehard. The world of sports is as vast as the ocean is deep, including the major leagues, the minor leagues, the colleagues, and everything in between. This is me, your boy Larry B. of IE Sports Radio, welcoming you to join me every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on The Defining Moment, a show that focuses on what really matters in the sports world, sports themselves, and nothing outside of them. Once again, tune in for The Defining Moment with me, your boy Larry B. every Monday evening at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern on IE Sports Radio, right here on Spreaker.com. We'll see you there. And we are back here on the Extra Mile on IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Daryl and Christopher here with you this evening. And this weekend, one of my most favorite times of the year for myself and Michael, who unfortunately is not here 
this evening. It is time for the Rolex 24 at, or not Rolex 24, sorry, the Le Mans 24 <laughs> at the Circuit de la Sarthe in France. I love my 24-hour races, so I apologize on that one. But this is the big one, the grandfather of all 24-hour races. 60 cars going to take to one of the few remaining circuits that still use public roads in La Sarf. They actually shut down the road starting last week to set up the course. And it's a real old school feel when it gets dark during this race. There are no lights on this track. So it is down to you, the headlights on the car, and your bravery to push as fast as you can during the nighttime. That is where all the calamity usually happens in this race, even though most of it is run in the daylight due to this race's position in the summer. Now, last year when it was run in September due to, well, the plague, it was more even when it came to day and night, but going to be back to the traditional mostly daytime running with a short but frantic night section. As we go look at the weather for Lamar, thanks to our handy dandy Google, uh, we are not expecting any real rain for the race. 20% chance of precipitation on Saturday, but by the time the race gets started at 3 p.m., there's virtually no chance of the wet stuff and Sunday. Slight chances early morning for rain, but expected to be a dry, flat-out Lamont 24. And, Chris, I don't know how much you watch of this race, but even catching a couple of hours of it, it is really fun for me to have a race like this where you get up in the morning, there's a race. You eat lunch, there's a race. You go to dinner, hey, they're still racing. It's racing paradise for the purists out there. And it's going to be a lot of fun this weekend. Yeah. And, and usually I don't watch it during the daylight hours. It's, it's almost exclusively like 11 PM to 2 AM our time, which is, which is still obviously um, dark over there, but, but um, it's, it's just a little more exciting for me. And, and it's less of a, a commitment for the day, you know, just kind of, pop in for a little while at night and there's something calming about watching it at night too. something kind of calming, but exhilarating at the same time. You know, I, yeah. I personally love driving at night. I, I just love it. Um, and so it's, there's a, a certain, certain sort of Zen that comes over me um, with nighttime driving that I kind of live vicariously through them a little bit. It's a lot of fun seeing them out there and your pole sitters for the 24 hours of Lama, which gets started Saturday morning at 9 a.m. here in the United States. Uh, Toyota will lead the field overall to the start with the number seven of Sebastian Buemi, Brendan Hartley, and Rio Hirakawa going to lead the field to green or to the tricolor, sorry, on Saturday in LMP2 WRT. Last year's winner with Sean Galal, Robert Frins, and Rene Rast will lead the, that class to the start of the race in a near 30-car LMP2 category. That is the deepest LMP2 field we have had in quite some time. Um, and probably the biggest ever. So the LMP2 field, extremely healthy. That's the best thing I can say about that. Uh, in the swan song of GTE, Tommy Milner, Nick Tandy, and Alexander Sims in the number 64 Corvette C8R will lead that class to the start for myself and Corvette fans everywhere. We are really happy to see a front row lockout for Corvette after the terrible last half decade they have had at the Le Mans 24. Anything that could go wrong did go wrong. And most recently, they just got hit with the bot bat and were just uncompetitive. But they will be leading the field to the tricolor, which is the flag of France. That's how they traditionally start the race. And Ferrari with Luis, of course, 
now this is the one where all the names that I uh, cannot pronounce. Vincent Abro, Conrad Grunwald, and Louis Preti going to lead that field to the start in a Ferrari, number 61 Ferrari 488 GTE. So Ferrari, Corvette, WRT, and Toyota can lead the field to the start of the Rolex 24 on Saturday. Not going to get into a who we think is going to win because if you try to pick a 24-hour race to see who's going to win, you are absolutely insane. You cannot, you do not decide who wins this race. No one but Lasarth will decide who's going to win this race this weekend. Absolutely. And, and just to go back to uh, Corvette, it's nice, a uh, little bit of American pride there going overseas, obviously. And, and um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's nice seeing, seeing some success. Um for an Amer- American manufacturer, so mm-hmm. we we don't get that in Europe very often. <clears throat> Genos, <clears throat> um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, no, it'll be it's it's nice to see, you know, obviously a, a, a U.S. based manufacturer having some success. Yep. We'll see how it goes with the Glick uh, this weekend. Uh, Got some mixed feelings about that team. We're not going to get into that right now, but they qualified third and fourth, but the Alpine bumped down to fifth at the end of the day. Um, we're also going to be getting Peugeot adding their two hypercars to the mix starting at Monza. So we're going to start seeing the growth of the hypercar category. And we got the announcement this weekend. Well, actually, before I go that, let me finish that thread as we're going to go from five or from Four cars that they usually have to six cars for the regular season. And that category is only going to grow because this weekend we got the announcement of the BMW uh, GT prototype, which will run in IMSA, and the Cadillac GTP that broke cover this weekend as well. A beautiful looking car, by the way. That car is going to be campaigned by Ganassi in both IMSA and the World Endurance Championship. They will be joining Penske, who will be running the Porsche factory effort in the World Endurance Championship. So we can guarantee that for next season, this is going to be Toyota versus Glickenhaus versus Alpine versus Penske Porsche versus Chip Ganassi Cadillac in the hypercar category. Bring on 2023 in the World Endurance Championship because I am excited for how this class is going to go. Oh, and Peugeot is going to be there as well for the full season next year. Bring on 2023, baby. The hypercar class is going to be insane. I think we may have lost Chris there. Yep, we're having some cable issues with Chris. I'm going to give this a moment, but and I kind of shorted the field a little bit. It's 62 cars. Yeah, I mean, for, now. yeah now I got you. It's 62 oh. for Lamar this year, not 60. All right. Let's try something different here. Yeah, I think that cable is actually starting to go. Yep. Yeah, oh, well, I'll get a new one for next week. Not a big deal. Yeah. But, yeah, as I was saying, the the top class, the World Endurance Championships, get pretty spicy next year with six manufacturers competing in it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's uh, – it's definitely good news for sure. Um, yeah. More manufacturers, more competition. Um, now we just need to uh, – see some new teams join formula one yeah but who's gonna pay that quarter of a million dollar entry fee only one name i can think of there's only a couple names but i don't know if i want to see those folks with a formula one team but that's a story for another day um and also in 
GT prototype in America, even though these cars don't plan to run Le Mans, uh, Acura, BMW, um, Acura and BMW also have debuted their hypercars or GT prototypes. I'm sorry. Those cars are going to be on the grid in America. So we're going to have a good mix of those cars, but unfortunately we will not be getting Toyota crossing the pond to race in IMSA. And I am sad about that, but them's the breaks. So Lamar 24, make sure you try to watch it. It'll be on motor trend this weekend. That is the, United States rights carrier for the World Endurance Championship. So if you don't have that channel, you can watch it on Motor Trend On Demand. That's usually when I watch it. They'll have a couple of feeds up for the entire time. Uh, Enjoy the race. And uh, I'll be watching, so I'll also be on Twitter. So hit me up if you want to talk about it. And that will lead us quickly now into IndyCar. I did not get to watch a lot of this race because it started at the same time as... The NASCAR race. Thanks, TV executives. Uh, Will Power picks up the win in Detroit. Last race in Belle Isle, Chris. Uh, They're going to be moving downtown. But um, that Belle Isle track had a lot of good moments. Um, Everyone talks about Juan Pablo Montoya's lap of the gods there in 1999. And it was a technical track that really stressed the drivers and well, they freed up the park for all those people that were complaining, and now the race is going downtown, and we'll see if they can keep the magic there in Detroit. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's hope so. Obviously, Detroit, Motor City. Um, so you, you'd you really expect any any racing to uh, certainly put on a show there, and, and um, so let's let's hope that, that the uh, – the new the new course does just that mm-hmm. so we'll see how how that goes and by the way uh scott dixon still hasn't won a race he is still in the championship hunt as they get into the second half of the season do not let that crafty old guy out of your sight because it might be the new kids running the block but old age and trickery can still get youth and exuberance in the end. So we will see how that goes. Will Power currently leads the way on 255 points. Marcus Erickson second, buoyed by that Indy 500 victory with 252. Pato Award in third with 243 points. They will be on the track at Road America. That will be this Sunday at 1230. You'll be able to watch that on Peacock and NBC. Just got to pick that for this weekend. And right now, Scott Dixon is in six, 202 points back. Joseph Newgarden, fifth, 208. Alex Plo, last year's champion, 241. So it is still anyone's race as we head into one of the best road courses in America, which is Road America. Can't wait. So we've got Formula One going into Baku. And Chris, we know this track is Chaos Central. Absolutely, which is why it should put on, as always, another show. Yeah. Don't have to remind you what happened here last year. Uh, Getting ready for a restart after Max Verstappen blew a tire. Uh, Lewis Hamilton forgot how brake bias works. Went into turn one, hit the brakes. The car did not stop. Ended up out of the points in what was one of the more dramatic scenes in what was an incredibly dramatic 2021 season. I don't think we're going to have that issue this year, mainly because the Mercedes aren't really that fast enough. But Ferrari, if you're going to get back into this championship, they have to have a flawless weekend, in my opinion, because they have absolutely given up the advantage to Red Bull as we head into the summer months. Yeah. Um, and the the thing is, Daryl, Ferrari is much better suited for a track, for for a, a true, um, you know, city circuit 
they are set up for it. For Red Bull wins their races on speed, just mm-hmm. pure straight line speed. Yet they botched Monaco in just Ferrari, truly Ferrari fashion, and they cannot afford to do that again under any circumstance yet something tells me they will manage to find a way but uh, realistically they need to uh, you know, pardon my French but pull their heads out of their asses and do the obvious thing which is if you're in the lead you cover your what Red Bull does mm-hmm. you 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 react. You don't go out there and, and, and try to be, you know, be proactive or anything. You need to sit back, cover cover what Red Bull does, and you can probably win this race as long as you don't shoot yourself in the foot. Mm-hmm. But Ferrari will probably manage. Probably. Um the problem with that is with everything that's gone on with Ferrari, if they don't win this championship, Benato is not going to be there. I think we can say that with the certainty. Uh, Marinello is not going to be happy that their best chance to win a championship is being squandered like this. Now, they re-signed the driver, so they're going to stay, but heads are going to roll in that strategy department if they cannot bring this home and they probably needed to clear out those ranks to be honest a couple of years ago because they have already shown this year they're really not up to the task of fighting Red Bull from the pit wall so they've got to have everything go right for them Mercedes has had a similar issue but their issue was more of they were a front runner for far too long the difference with Ferrari is They haven't been in a real fight until now, and it's showing every single weekend. Absolutely, and uh, unfortunately for for our Ferrari fans, um, like Michael, it's it's going to be it's going to continue to be painful until they figure it out. Whatever it is that they can't figure seem to figure out. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I feel bad for them, but at the end of the day, they they lose their races on their own. They they mm-hmm. don't have help from people. It is their own strategy calls that have ultimately lost them quite a few races this season. Yeah. And it's one of the things that are costing people this season. Uh, poor Mick Schumacher has caused 4 million euros in damage to his Haas F1 car in two years. And Gunther Steiner has had enough. Uh, Multiple outlets reporting uh, that Gunther says there's going to have to be a conversation if there's another heavy shunt with Mick Schumacher. Now, we spent a lot of time the last couple of years talking about his teammate or his ex-teammate, for good reason. But with that guy no longer employed in motorsports, the microscope is now on Mick Schumacher, and Mick hasn't looked that great, to be honest. Um, He's been slower than Kevin Magnuson, who has not been in Formula 1 for quite some time. And the two accidents that he's had this year, coupled with the two major accidents he had last year it's starting to raise questions now about whether or not formula one is cut out for mick schumacher yeah and it's it's obviously a shame uh that we're having these types of conversations but but you know they have to be had and and you know, my counter to the Mick Schumacher thing would be that look, uh, look at Latifi. He is just the worst. I, he's like Toby from the office, but in the Formula One world. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd hate to see 
Latifi's repair bill, Lance Stroll. I mean, you've got, you've got, you know, part of what Mick, Mick's got going on is he has an impossible legacy to live up to. Mm-hmm. While no one expected him to be his father, he's, he's carrying that weight, you know? Um, whether it's whether it's obvious or not, it's it's there, and you I know, wonder if that is causing some of those issues for him. That's the fact that that's trying to race what I wonder. That's yeah. what I wonder, and and you know, but but you got you got a guy like Vettel who's almost taken Mick under his wings, and it, it's really nice seeing that um, that camaraderie, and and obviously. Um, Sebastian, one of the one of the few guys still on the grid who who raced with Michael, um, and, and it's weird. Just every year, you know, every every retirement, you know, like Kimmy Kimmy leaves, and and then now it's one less guy who raced with Michael, and it's it's really weird that that that's the way that that we talk because you know if you think about any other sport, you know, people don't say oh that, well you there goes one more guy that didn't play with Michael Jordan or there's, you know, are we going to get to the point with Tiger Woods where we're saying, Hey, the PGA tours, you know, towards the end of our lifetime anyway, Daryl is, Hey, we've got a, a field of players who've never played with Tiger Woods, but that's, and that's coming we, up with uh, Tiger's injuries. Yeah, but you know what I'm saying though. We don't talk about that with any other sport, any other racing series. Is mm-hmm. is we don't say this is the last game. You know, oh, they race with Michael Schumacher. You know, we don't say that. Well, we say that, but you don't say that about other sports. And and at the end of the day, that's that travels with Mick. As much as we want to admit it or or, or not admit it, it it's there. And he's always going to have a ride because of that. But I, I'd like to see him in a real car too, though. Not saying yeah. Haas is in a real car, but I want to see what he can do in in AlphaTauri. Or I mean, I don't think it's realistic that he gets a, a, a like a McLaren or or a Ferrari or, or a Mercedes. Certainly not a Red Bull, but I, I could see him in like an AlphaTauri or. Um, Alfa Romeo, maybe. I don't know. I just want to see him out of Haas. And I want to see him be successful. Yeah, I think we all want to see him be successful and possibly out of Haas if need be, but we'll we'll have to see uh, what happens with Mick. Hopefully he can get out of this weekend without having any more shunts against the wall like what he's been having because it has been crazy for uh, Mick the last couple of years, but it's time now for us to make our picks in nearest the win. We have NASCAR at Sonoma. IndyCar is at Road America. Formula One is at Baku. Just make sure they are they are running tomorrow. So I'm gonna go ahead with our picks and something would tell me to pick Leclerc, but I just can't trust Ferrari right now. And I've already picked Verstappen, so I'll go with Perez to sneak one from his teammate in Azerbaijan for the second straight week. I I picked Perez last week, right? No, we picked Verstappen. We picked Verstappen. Okay. <sighs> I'm going to go with Carlos. Okay. Um, and for NASCAR, so who did I pick last week? You were asking the guy with ADHD to remember last week. Um, Kyle Bush. Yeah. Kyle Bush. Um uh, 
I am going to say... Let's say Christopher Bell. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go on a flyer. I think AJ Allmendinger picks up the win. That's, that's not a bad guess. <laughs> Even if you don't get the win, you're probably going to get it based on position anyway over me. Yeah. Christopher Bell's kind of like an all or nothing. Yeah, Christopher either he either has a good race or has an absolutely awful race, and there's no in between yet for that kid. It's, um, it's kind of like twenty three eleven this year. Oh God, don't remind me. <laughs> um, for IndyCar, I'm going to take the Indy five hundred champion. I think Marcus Erickson gets it done. Did I pick? I can't ask you. Um. Did I pick Pelo? No, I think I picked McLaughlin. I think you may have, yeah. I think I did. A uh, little optimism there. <laughs> I mean, he was um, doing good, and then he ended up yeah. down the tire barrier. Yeah. Um, this is a tough one. Let's go new. I'm ready to get hurt again, Daryl. Okay. Colton Colton Herta. Oh, good luck. (laughs) I'm writing these down now in a notepad so that I can remember these going forward. So I'm choosing Erickson and Chris is choosing Colton Herta. For this weekend. Remember, if you want to get in on Nearest the Win, just type Nearest the Win on Twitter with who you think is going to win this week's races, and we will get you in on the count on the Twitter. So thank you so much. And speaking of Twitter, I am at DK Junior 12, Michael's at Michael underscore War 25, and Chris is at Fiji Sims. So make sure you chat us up on Twitter. We love talking to you guys during the week. And of course, make sure you get in on the IE Sports Radio Patreon. $5 gets you a shout-out on all 32 of our shows and higher tiers include IE Sports Radio merchandise, access to the podcast, the university, and even a chance to be on the segment of our flagship show, The Defining Moment. So make sure you get in on that. Thank you to Bay Area Raised, M. Lowe's Great, Key to the Gate, and an anonymous Patreon donor for making sure the lights stay on over here. And if you've missed any episode of any iSports Radio show, you can pick it up on anywhere where podcasts can be heard. And, of course, as well, the YouTube repository, which has episodes all the way back from the very beginning of iSports Radio. And you can hear myself and Michael Ward trying not to fangasm during a interview with Mario Andretti. Make sure you check that out. Folks, thank you so much for listening to The Extra Mile. For Chris, I'm Daryl. Thank you so much. We'll see you at the next green flag. Good night, everybody.